to get going. Uh, some of you may know, or some of you may not know, that uh, Emerus has been a little, uh, Emerus Westicott uh, has been a little under the weather this week. So he has asked uh, his very, very distinguished senior uh, historian in the uh, Division of Human Studies to do the introduction. And so here I am. Uh, we are going to uh, mute you uh, during the uh, main portion of this uh, presentation, and then we're going to uh, allow you to, uh, to chime in. If any of you have uh, comments that you would like to leave in chat, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, now, before we start today, uh, next Thursday, that is September 30th, uh, the Bergen Forum will be given by Risa Peacock, who is well known, I think, to many people uh, who are here on campus. Uh, she is an artist, she is an educator, uh, she is an independent curator who will be discussing her recent artistic practice and her curatorial research. Uh, her talk is called A Big Moody Artist Talk. And I would also want to remind you that there will be a talk tomorrow, the ENS talk, the Environmental Studies talk, uh, beginning at 1220. We have a, a link out to that. If you need it and you don't have it, I can certainly provide it. Uh, it's being given by a former student here at Alfred University, graduated in 2004 by the name of Fena Mandelong. Uh, and she is talking about garbage. She's talking about recycling. So you're welcome to that. Now this week, uh, we are taking advantage of, and I'm reading here what uh, Emerson had sent to me, the pandemic's silver lining. That is to say, we're very pleased to have another outside uh, speaker. Uh, the speaker today is Jonathan Lurie. Uh, Jonathan Lurie has taught history for many years at Rutgers University, now retired, and he has been a visiting professor at West Point. He is the author of a fine little book called Military Justice in America, and more recently, a biography of former President and Chief Justice William Howard Taft, and told me just moments ago uh, that he is uh, about to publish, but book was uh, accepted, I believe, yesterday or today, uh, a book about the pocket veto, again, a legal history about the, uh, the, 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 the pocket veto, of which probably most of us know relatively little. Uh, he is also, I might add, the husband of Maxine Lurie, who is an Alfred University graduate of, I believe, 1962, is once the uh, editor of the Fiat Lux. Uh, uh, John and Maxine's daughter, Debbie, is a graduate of Alfred University, and her husband, Jason, is a graduate of Alfred University, and as a matter of fact, spoke here uh, at a symposium that was organized by the business school just last year. Uh, uh, Jonathan Lurie's talk is called Military Justice. Is it still a contradiction in terms? Uh, John, I know that you asked me to you know, extend my uh, introduction for 45 minutes, but in the circumstances, I will let you get going right now. Military Justice, is it still a contradiction in terms? Well, thank you very much, Gary. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. As you go back many, 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 many years. And it seems not too long ago, I joined Mac for her 50th reunion at Alfred. So we have interesting connections. Now, the question in my talk is, as Gary said, military justice, is it still a contradiction in terms? Well, I'm not going to answer that now but I hope to answer it at the end of the, my presentation. Uh, let me first note at the beginning that military justice is nothing new. It's existed since armies. It goes back centuries in many different forms. And in America, you might like to know that the Military justice system in its origins predates the Constitution. Court martials are the oldest form of federal trials. They predate the district courts, they predate the appellate courts by many, many years, and of course they predate the United States Supreme Court, which was established when the Constitution was adopted. So military justice is an old, old, phenomenon in American history. Now, the articles of war 
which were adopted in the American form by drafted, I should say, by Thomas Jefferson and John Adams at the midst of the revolution. And with very few exceptions, the Articles of War remain with only minor changes until the end of World War II. That's a long time to be governed by a code which is drafted in the 1700s. Of course, the Navy had its own version of military justice, appropriately called Rocks and Shoals, a nickname for the articles that govern the act to govern the Navy. And in those days, the Navy and the Army were totally separate. They were totally independent of each other. They had nothing to do with each other. And frequently there was friction between them. The cabinet had a secretary of war and there was also a secretary of the Navy. Now let's jump ahead to the post World War II era. World War II was fought with the old articles of war as I said before. Uh, and at the end of World War II, there was pressure, real pressure to bring some reforms to military justice. Now, one of the sources for that pressure was the episode that took place concerning a private named Eddie Slovic. There is a picture of Eddie Slovic. And he, if he sort of looks like any other ordinary GI in 1945, well, that's just what he was. But he had an unfortunate fate. And if you will look at the next slide, notice how much older he looks now. This is because the actor playing Eddie Slovic was in his 40s when they made the movie. Slovic was in his 20s. This is just a snippet of the film, The Execution of Private Slovic, a, well, a movie well worth seeing, by the way. It's based on the book by William Bradford Huey, H-U-I-E, I believe. I'm not sure I'm spelling that right, but anyway, you can look it up. Now, why do I mention Eddie Slovic? None of you have probably ever heard of him. Well, I mention him because he was the only, the only American soldier to be executed in World War II for desertion. There were numerous executions in a war as far ranging as World War II, but only one soldier was executed. This is the man. Now, why do I mention him in talking about military justice? Uh, you, can, you can take that away now, Mary, if you would. Okay. I mention him because his trial was kind of unusual in our, to our terms. There were no lawyers involved. In the second place, his lawyer called no witnesses. In the third place, Slovic didn't testify. In the fourth place, his lawyer did not cross-examine any of the few witnesses brought forward by the government. In the fifth place, the trial took barely half an hour. And at the end, Slovic was sentenced, quote, to death by musketry, unquote. Now, to I guess all of us here, that sounds offensive, the way he was treated, does it not? But that was all legal in 1945. And indeed, Slovic was given several opportunities to return to the fight, to return to the front. And you might note that this episode takes place in January 1945, as the Battle of the Bulge is raging. And it is by no means clear in 1945 how quickly the Americans were going to win, if they were indeed in World War II. So remember the context. Anyway, not only is Slovak executed, 
but it's done according to the existing particles of war. And that's the point I want to make. Now, moving on, there are a lot of lawyers who fought in World War II. Either they volunteered or they were drafted. Many of them served in the JAG Corps. And there was also a lot of pressure because for the first time, World War II is a war which is covered dramatically by motion picture. And the news was much more readily available. And by the end of World War II, several decisions were made which affect our story. The first was that it was decided to unify the armed services. So in 1946 or 47, Congress passes a bill creating the Defense Department as opposed to the Secretary of War or the Secretary of the Navy. Now we had a Defense Department and until his tragic suicide, it was headed by James Florestal, who literally worked himself to death in the cause of the United States. And it did not make much sense with the unified armed services to have separate military justice systems to govern the army as opposed to the Navy. And of course, in those days, the Air Force was an adjunct of the army. So in 1948, it was decided to convene a committee to draft a uniform code of military justice. And I emphasize the word uniform. It was headed by a well-known professor of law at Harvard Law School named Edmund Morgan, whose son, by the way, with the same name, was one of our most distinguished American historians. Morgan, who taught evidence at Harvard Law School, was tapped by Forrestal to be chair of this committee, which existed, which consisted, I might say, of four or five individuals, one from each of the armed services, a sort of undersecretary. Morgan was chair. And I should mention one other point about the Morgan Committee. One of the reasons military justice had been so effect, ineffective in reforming itself in the years of the late 19th century, including World War I and the end of World War II, is because the military was very quick to veto any proposed changes that might be suggested. They were equally quick to commission reports and investigations into military justice. Between 1940 and 1947, no less than seven reports were authored by various committees and sent to either the Army or the Navy, and they disappeared. You can find mention of them in my first book on the subject. They disappeared. Well, Morgan and his committee wanted to make sure that that would not happen with the recommendations and the proposition to create a uniform code. So they persuaded Secretary Forrestal to order the committee that if there was a dispute, and there were on several issues, as you'll hear in a few minutes, he would decide what the issue was. In other words, the, the representative of the Army or the representative of the Navy, the undersecretaries who served on the Morgan Committee could delay perhaps, but they could not derail. That's probably the most significant thing about the makeup of the Morgan Committee. And actually it turns out that in the few instances where Forrest Hall was forced to intervene, he invariably took the side that Morgan had laid out in his reports, various reports to the secretary. So you have the Morgan committee, you have it in a very short time, 
when you consider that they are convened in 1948 and the code is finished in drafting in 1949, it's a remarkable achievement. And then it goes to Congress and it sits for over a year in Congress, knowing the way Congress works, that should not surprise you at all. But ultimately it is adopted. And in 1950, the Uniform Code of Military Justice becomes a reality. And it still governs the military to this day. Now, what are the, what are the contributions that the new code made to military justice? I would say there are three that are worth emphasizing. I've already talked about the fact that it unified the system. Military justice in the form of the code would apply to everyone in each of the services. No more separate codes for the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, or the Marine Corps, which of course in time of war is governed by the Navy. So that's the first point. That's why the term uniform is so important. Most unique, however, to the code was the innovations concerning the administration of military justice. That's what we're talking about today. Go back very briefly to Eddie Slovak. There was no appellate court for Slovak to appeal to. There was no appeals court in the military until our time, until the code is adopted. A true, the president might pardon a convicted court martial person, but the president could not modify, could not revoke the sentence, could not erase the sentence, could not act as a court of appeals does. There was no such thing. So the most important contribution the military justice system benefited from in the new code was it created a court of appeals for the armed forces on two levels. First, it created an intermediate court called in those days courts of military review and then it created a Supreme Court for the military called the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, or as we used to say, USCAF. Now, USCAF exists to this day. I suspect most of you have never heard of it. I'm sure all of you have never seen the building where the court functions. None of you, I'm sure, could tell me the name of the members of it. And I'm sure none of you have ever witnessed one of its trials. Uh, there's an interesting story about this. Like many courts in America, our judges, in terms of public, we are used to the concept of federal judges being appointed to the Constitution says, good behavior. Uh, and the district courts, the appellate courts, and of course, the United States Supreme Court all have life tenure terms. There's something to be said for that. On the other hand, there are a number of federal courts which do not have a life tenure. They are called Article I courts. They're created under Article I rather than Article III, which is the judicial article, which describes the federal courts, including the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, et cetera. My court, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, is an Article I court. Its judges were first appointed for 15-year terms, although the first three were appointed for 15, 10, and as I recall, five. And in theory, the justices, the judges are, are subject to reappointment. 
in fact, that's never happened with one exception. And that was the first judge of the court, the first chief judge of the court who was reappointed. But for the general history, reappointment is rare and non-existent. Now, I mentioned how significant this court is functioning in many ways as the Supreme Court of the military. Why were its judges not given life tenure? Interesting question. I can only propose a couple of possibilities. The first is that Congress, in particular the Senate, uh, like the idea of having appointments to ratify on a regular basis. And in terms of life tenure, Congress doesn't do that. Once they get confirmed, they're beyond the reach of Congress. I'm sure there are members of Congress right now who regret this very much, but that's the way, that's the way it is. And you might note that the House voted life tenure for the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. The Senate has never granted it. And to this day, the judges are appointed for, as I recall, 15 year terms. And as I said, for the most part, that's it, they're out. So presidents can look forward to one or two appointments on the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces during their term possibly. Now, in most cases, the president has no idea that this court exists. Uh, they probably don't know who they appoint to it. Most of this is done on the level of the general counsel's office in the Defense Department. All right, let me say a tiny bit about the other contributions. I've talked about the establishment of the court. I've talked about the single code for the armed services. Let me also talk about some of the changes that took place. The first is the importance of the appellate system. Every member of the armed forces is virtually guaranteed an appeal process, something Slovak didn't have. Uh, the judges of the intermediate court are appointed by the JAG officers, as I recall, the JAG of each army, the judge advocate general, who is the senior legal officer in each of the military branches. And they, as I believe, are subject to reappointment, unlike the uh, Supreme Court above them, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. So every, every one who is accused of a crime has at least two shots at a trial. First, there is the lower level trial, which we know in the general term of court martial. And then there's an appeal to a, another court. Now, the difference between that court and the Supreme Court of the military is that the Supreme Court of the military has to be civilian. The intermediate court does not. Most of them are former officers in the JAG group. And there has been some comment that that might not be the most desirable system to have. And that raises a point, last points I want to make before turning to questions and reaction. There is a real question in the minds of military leaders as to how much civilian oversight of the military is to be encouraged. Uh, and it, it's a very divisive question. That's one reason the Morgan Committee insisted that the code include the phrase that the members of the Court of Appeals of the Armed Forces shall be from civilian life, unquote. And they are. That's not true of the court of review, of military review. But one of, the, one of the other 
major contributions under the new system, it's not new now, the code is 60 years old, is that there's a fairly enduring concept now of military due process. The term means something. It's not a, as I said at the beginning, it's not a contradiction in terms. And there are a number of ways in which military justice has improved over the last 60 years, not only with the appeal process, not only with the right to a review on two levels, but also the idea that much of the constitution is to apply to the military. You do not shed your rights of due process by putting on a uniform. And that could not have been said, I think, in the days of Eddie Slovak. Now, uh, we, we have to understand that when you're in battle and the commander says you're going to take that hill, you don't want to sit on your assets and start quoting Lochner versus New York and due process. That is not the time. And you have to remember also that military justice deals with the military. You can't separate them. So you have to remember finally that the aim of the military is to win battles. That's why you have it. It's not intended to provide infallible justice. And much as I hate to say it, as a legal historian who's devoted his career to legal history, there's some, something to be said for that. On the other hand, as we've seen since the code was adopted, the military has gone a long way toward making sure that due process means something. There was a time when the commander would receive the words, the verdict of the court martial of one of his soldiers, and the commander could say, that's not harsh enough, fix it. Increase the penalty, hang him, order him shot. And that would be legal. That can't happen now. Another important point, the last one I want to make is the Supreme Court of the Military, USCAP, United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, can agree to hear almost any case it wants to. Uh, there are several types of cases it has to hear. For example, it has to hear, it has to consider death penalty cases. Now, in this day and age, the military does not impose a lot of death penalty verdicts unlike time of war, but the Supreme, the, the Court of Appeals must review them and consider them, but it can take on any case it deems appropriate. If it feels there's a constitutional issue, it can agree to hear the appeal case. <laughs> the Supreme Court of the United States generally keeps its arm's length from the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces but they are supreme, they are the Supreme Court, and they do have authority to overrule the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces to some extent. So let me answer the question I raised at the outset before turning to questions. Is it better? Yes. Can it be improved? Very much so. Will it be improved? That's more difficult. The military did and worked out over the years very sophisticated methods of dealing with congressmen and legislators in Washington. And you have only to ask yourself what happens to your senator, Senator Chilibrand's efforts to get a law passed which will take the command's authority to convene court martials out of the commander and put it in the hands of an independent legal expert, something that should have been done many, many years ago. Senator Gillibrand still hasn't been able to pass it. Maybe it will this time. 
because it's been attached to the budget for the military. So you should stay tuned. So there you are, people. That's a bird's eye view of military justice. And the balance of the time, I want you to feel free to fire away and ask any questions or make any comments that you wish to. All right, Gary? You got to unmute. You're all muted. Uh, Mari, if you could unmute everybody so that people can uh, weigh in with either comments or with questions. Uh, and uh, John, I'd like to just begin with one question, which has to do with uh, uh, kind of the issue of uh, severity of, uh, of, uh, uh, of punishment. Uh, it's one thing to say someone is going to be found guilty or not guilty within the context of a court martial. But then you find, uh, as for instance, I think we did, let's say, with uh, a very well-known incident, and that, of course, has to do with uh, the, uh, the My Lai uh, trial following, you know, during the Vietnam War, uh, very few were actually found guilty of the crimes of which they were accused. And of those who were, the sentences were surprisingly light, I think, from the perspective of those of us who were critics of uh, of developments at that point. Can you address the subject of, uh, of punishment? Well, uh, turning very quickly to the My Lai Massacre case, the trial of Lieutenant William Calley, the best book on that subject is by a good friend of mine and a fellow legal historian named Michael Belknap, M-I-C-H-A-L-B-E-L-K-N-A-P. And Mike makes the point that Cali was found guilty and no court refused to disturb that verdict. What actually happened to Cali in later years was due mostly to the misconduct of Richard Nixon, who at the time was president. But ultimately, Cali served a few months under house arrest, as I recall, and was ultimately feed and never served the rest of his term. But his penalty, his conviction was never reversed. He is to this day a convicted felon. And uh, last I heard, he runs a jewelry store in Georgia, I believe, and doesn't talk much. But there were quite a number of others, I think, who were charged. Henderson, oh, there, there Medina. Are, there are many instances where the penalties have been reduced or modified. And there are many instances where the president was pardoned. Remember, from the military perspective, a soldier in the stockade is not doing any good. That's not what they're in the military for. So you want to do your best to get them out and back into service, while at the same time accepting the severity, possibly, of what they were convicted of. And, and uh, I'll give you one small example. Uh, when I was working on my first volume, I visited Quantico, which as you know, is the big air, a big Marine base, not far from Washington. And they took me into the stockade, uh, fortunately into the prison cells. Fortunately, they didn't leave me there, but they, I, I did see them. And, uh, I was struck by how young some of the prisoners were. And I remarked to my host, the Colonel who was escorting me, and he said, well, <clears throat> they're, they're here. This is, he said, sort of an intermediate step. It's not as bad as Leavenworth or the major prisoners, prison camps for the military. Leavenworth is probably the most famous of them all, but here, he said the commander of the prisoner has to visit him every week. The commander has to keep close touch with his, who's, whoever the prisoner is. And in general, there is a mode of parole and getting them back to their unit as soon as possible. That may well mean not serving your full sentence. It depends on, on the circumstances and the context of the time. 
that's sort of a rounded way of answering your question, Gary. And for the rest of you, if you would uh, turn on your video, turn off your, uh, you know, to, uh, to turn off your mute so that we can hear you, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, post questions or uh, offer comments. I will, let me just add one episode, which sort of typifies what I was trying to say earlier. I spent a lot of time visiting military establishments as part of my work for this project I was on. And I remember to this day meeting a commander of a big base, who he was or what the base was is unimportant. But he knew what I was doing and he knew I was sent there by the chief judge of my court that I was working on military justice. And he said to me, he said, you know, professor, you don't have to worry about military justice here on this base because we never try anyone unless they're guilty. <laughs> now, if, if you think about that, that in a nutshell is what I was talking about in saying that military justice at some point needed to be reformed. Okay, fire away for people. I'd like to have you talk about uh, sexual harassment in uh, the military. Uh -huh. It's rampant and I, having been, um, having been an education services officer with the Army and the Air Force, I don't see anything has changed uh, since maybe the beginning of the military. <laughs> It's a well, big subject, I know. <laughs> I'm tempted to agree with you, but uh, actually I think it has changed to a great extent. Um, the, the military is much more aware than it ever has been of the uh, acidic, corrosive effects of military sexual harassment on the unit and on the morale of the company than it ever has been in the past. Uh, and the, 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 you have to understand that change comes slow in the military. They are not innovators. They are followers. The essence of military discipline is you do what you're told. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, in, in sexual harassment cases, the, the odds have been against the victim for many, many, many years. And this won't change until Congress passes the appropriate statutes. And Congress won't pass the appropriate statutes until they are pressured to do so. And that won't happen until the military leaders are persuaded that it's in their interest to control and counter and make this practice of sexual harassment so severe in penalty that it's to their interest to block it. And that's why Senator Chilibrands has been trying for I don't know, the last five, 10 years, almost since she's been in office to get a bill passed, which will reform that element of military justice. And so I, I agree with you. It, it's, it's hard to get the military from a sexist viewpoint to realize how appalling this is to anyone with any sensitivity on an important subject. On the other hand, the military has demonstrated that in terms of gays in the military, for example, it is capable of reform, it is capable of change. But you have to understand also that the abolishing of don't ask, don't tell a few years ago was not done by the military, it was done to the military, which is right. typical of the way these things work. Military didn't innovate women in the armed forces. Congress did. Mm -hmm. The women didn't integrate the the uh, army. Didn't integrate the services, forms of Afro Americans. 
Congress did, actually President Truman did in 1948. But change can take place. What else, folks? John? Yeah, speak. Um, I, I didn't hear you talk about any um, uh, sentencing guidelines relating to certain crimes. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, uh, I, I should have said that the in terms of the rules of evidence, the military's rules of evidence are virtually identical to the federal rules of evidence. And sentencing guidelines are quite detailed as to what is provided for. Uh, generally, there's a lot of, of discretion given to a court-martial on the to considering the level of offense, whatever the offense is. And I should mention that the, the court-martial has several levels. The first level is known as a captain's <clears throat> mask in the Navy or very informal, it, it, invo it doesn't involve a formal trial. The accused goes to the commander and says, Finley, I did it, what's my penalty? And the commander will say, you're restricted to base for two weeks and that's it. Or the commander can order you confined to barracks for X amount of days. That's the lowest level. Then there's an intermediate level of court-martial called a special court-martial. And then the most serious is a general court-martial, which involves a, a jury, members of the court, a military judge, and has the power of sentencing up to death. And that's, that's the most serious. I have, I have observed a number of court-martials, and they generally appear to be very similar to trials, to criminal trials, except they're in a military context. What else, people? Is there like, um, like at the current moment that you don't know of, is there any like prevention, like regulations or something in the military to prevent um, the soldiers from getting like rape or anything like that, like sexual assault? Cetera. Um, just wondering. I'm not sure I understood the question, ma'am. Can you uh, rephrase it for me? Um, like, is there like, I guess, any protection, like, of like prevention of of that happening? Like, anything to like, of, to help a regulator the amount of, of numbers. Of times of what happens in the site. I'm not sure how to phrase it. Um, can you prevent it from happening to begin with? Uh, I, I assume you're talking about preventing incidents from taking place in, in the, from ever occurring in the first place, particularly questions, matters of sexual harassment. Uh, I suppose the one way the military could do it is by emphasizing up front and from the beginning and frequently um, how important the subject is. The commander has a great deal of influence as to how his troops perceive what he thinks is important. And if the commander makes it clear that this is offensive, it's unacceptable, it will be punished severely. And if you want to, quote, get your ass in a sling, unquote, then do this sort of thing and beware what's going to happen to you. Most commanders don't talk like that. Uh -uh. And if they did, it might be a little different. And they could. But as I say, military, the military atmosphere is very hard to break into. I, I, I taught at West Point for a year as visiting professor and had a wonderful experience talking to the cadets who were fully aware of some of what we were talking about in this, in this session today. But anyway. Nick. Me? Unmute. Gary? No, uh, Vic. V Victor, were you going to make a comment? You got to unmute yourself. 
How are jurors selected? It's it's a good question. Uh, hmm. That's one of the one of the things that Senator Gillibrand is concerned about. Uh, how you impanel the court martial members. Uh, it has been fairly until fairly recently the prerogative of the commander to pick the jury. And that's been subject to a great deal of, of modification over the years. For example, under the code, an enlisted man can serve on a jury. And you might think that if an enlisted man is the subject of the court martial, he would welcome one of his peers on the jury. It turns out that generally we have found that the juror who's a enlisted person is generally among the harshest of the jury. Oh, wow. And so many people will encourage their client not to take advantage of that provision and not request that a, an enlisted member serve. Uh, the commander to this day convenes the court, mark, the court members, but there is there has been some change toward limiting his discretion in that field. And I don't remember the details now, but it is, it is not like the counsel for the defendant has the prerogative of rejecting off of him, this member of the court, that member of the court, it doesn't work that way in the military. Thank you. Gary, can I ask a question? Yeah, by all means. Uh, could you make a few comments on the proceedings at Guantanamo? Seems to have gone on for 20 years. <laughs> I, I could make many comments on <laughs> Guantanamo, except for to say they stink. Uh, and there's no excuse for it. Uh, this is this is a legacy of the first George Bush, as I recall, although Guantanamo is much older than, than his administration. Um, as, as I say, there's no excuse for it whatsoever. And the Supreme Court, in a number of cases, has slowly but surely whittled away at the powers in the military in, in uh, Guantanamo. Uh, why, they, why they have insisted to this day that they need a facility to hold prisoners like that, I don't understand. And I believe there's one, now they're down to one uh, defendant who's still housed there. Uh, it, it is, it is um, just, just to my mind, it's totally unacceptable. And unless the president chooses to do, actually, that, that's really not fair. Uh, Congress, uh, particularly Republicans in, in Congress, and they are close to dominating Congress again, if, if you should be aware of that. Republicans tend to regard Guantanamo as something sacred to their responsibility. They feel it's part of their mission to make sure it stays open and it receives what it needs. That's the question. the question a little bit more specifically. Is what was the procedure poorly designed? And that's why it has not really produced solid outcomes in a prompt manner, or is it decently designed and poorly administered? It's designed to do its job, which is to provide a Via a forum where accused can be prosecuted. And in theory, the way they are prosecuted is the same as any other court martial. It's just in a different atmosphere and it's far removed from public interest and public awareness and public perception of what's going on. That's the thing about Guantanamo, it's down there. It's not here, it's not in Fort Dix, it's not in Camp Lejeune, it's not in key military American bases, it's out of the country. 
and and uh, reporting is hard to get there. That that so the, uh, on paper, the military justice system in Guant different from military justice anywhere else. But the way the inmates are treated, the way they're housed, the way they're uh, handled is, I suspect, different. I'm going to interject here. It is one o'clock. Uh, some of you may have class. Uh, so we're going to end the formal uh, uh, lecture right now. I do want to remind all of you uh, that uh, Risa Peacock will be speaking at our Bergen Forum next year. I also want to thank uh, John Lurie for joining us for the, uh, uh, for the last hour, and I want to thank you for uh, participating. Uh, I'm going to leave the uh, Zoom on for a few minutes, so if any of you would like to you know, kind of hang around, you're more than welcome to do so. If, John, you're willing to do so, and uh, for the others, uh, uh, so long. Thank you again for... Uh, for your attendance.